Well, everyone, welcome to uh, um, the uh, uh, CubeSat series uh, webinars from uh, Taiwan Space Union. Thank you all for uh, joining us. Um, this is our second talk today. Our speaker is Professor Mengu Cho from uh, the Kyushu Institute of Technology, or QTech. Professor Cho will be uh, sharing with us his experiences on uh, developing uh, lean satellites um, over uh, low costs and short times. So. Uh, Thank you very much, Professor Cho, for uh, speaking to us today. And uh, whenever you're ready, please uh, feel free to begin. So uh, thank you very much uh, for the introductions. And thank you very much for uh, inviting me uh, to this uh, webinar series. I'm uh, very happy to uh, make a presentation today. So uh, let me first uh, introduce uh, my university, uh, Kyushu Institute of Technologies, QTEC. Or, uh, you can say Taiwan here, <laughs> although it's uh, only half of us. Uh, yes, uh, we are located, uh, located west to the Tokyo, about 1,000 kilometers, uh, where uh, engineering schools are uh, founded uh, over 110 years ago and located in the Kitakyushu region, uh, which is fairly uh, urban areas. Uh, so if you come to uh, our place, maybe in a couple of weeks, uh, you can see these very nice uh, cherry blossoms. Well, this year you cannot come, but uh, please try next year. <laughs> this uh, when you come uh, in May, when you come in May, you can see this very nice uh, wisteria garden. And if you see, if you come in July, you can have got this uh, very uh, UNESCO, uh, UNESCO World Heritage uh, Festival. Okay. Um, of course, we have lots of issues and those things. Yes. Okay. Uh, at the QTEC. Uh, we have a history of a space engineering education since 1993. And uh, in 2004, uh, we started the laboratory of spacecraft environment interaction engineering. This is basically a uh, uh, research theme was how to survive in space. And we changed to laboratory of lean satellite enterprises and in-orbit experiment in April uh, 2024, so about one year ago. And uh, I'll explain this one a little bit. And we have uh, started the Center for Nanosatellite Testing since 2010. And uh, in 2018, we started the Department of Space Systems Engineering. Uh, this is the first academic curriculum in Japan uh, dedicated to uh, space engineering. We do not do uh, airplane. Uh, it's not aerospace, it is a space. This is the Center for Non-Satellite Testing. Uh, we are capable of testing uh, system, uh, also component testing, up to 50 centimeter and 50 kilograms. Uh, radiation test uh, we do at some, uh, some other places, but uh, other than radiation, we can do all kinds of uh, testing. So when we build our first satellite, our satellite uh, we don't go out of the campus. We just do everything uh, inside. And uh, this uh, facility is open to anybody. Uh, so external user can come and, uh, and use facilities. Uh, not only Japan, but we have uh, other satellites from abroad, like the uh, Philippines, uh, Vietnam, uh, uh, Malaysia, Thailand, and Singapore, and uh, the, as far as to the uh, Egypt or uh, Finland, and also Costa Rica. Yes. So there are the, we are open to everybody. Because your satellite is very small, yes, uh, you can bring it. Yes. And also, not only uh, testing uh, other people's satellite, uh, we have a history of uh, building uh, satellite ourselves. This is a whole year tools uh, we launched for the first time about a uh, year, uh, 10 years ago. And since whole year tools, uh, we have a history uh, of uh, launching uh, 21 satellites. Uh, since 20, uh, 2012, and the five satellites are on the pipeline, and uh, these three uh, will be released uh, this uh, Sunday. Yes, uh, it, these three are already uh, in uh, ISS. These uh, all other satellites already uh, went to the orbit. So with this number of satellites, actually we are the uh, since if we limit to the satellite launched after 2012, uh, we are actually number one in terms of numbers. Yes, we have, we are launched a lot of uh, one UK sat. So uh, some may argue that, uh, yes, that's because we are, you are the uh, launching one UQ sat. Right. 
Sorry about that one. But uh, yes, uh, in terms of numbers, yes, uh, we are the number one in the, in the world. Yes. So uh, in 2020, uh, we inaugurated new laboratory, laboratory of green satellite enterprises and the in orbit experiment. Uh, short name is the same. Uh, it's the same as uh, the before. Uh, we used to call it laboratory spacecraft environment interesting engineering. But anyway, so our vision is to contribute to the space activity of humanity by bringing diversity to the space sector by lean satellite. I'll explain about the lean satellite, but basically it is the same as a small satellite. So if you look at the space sectors, great product such as rocket or satellite is at the top of pyramid. But uh, uh, in terms of numbers, uh, the some economies or uh, the personnel operations, it's only tiny part of the uh, entire space sectors. The primary applications, such as the uh, satellite communication, broadcasting, those things, uh, is much bigger than this flight product. Also, secondary and uh, the, the following applications, such as GPS, uh, image analysis, and those things, are even, even bigger. So our idea, vision, is to bring in diverse talent through the lean satellite activity, and expand this basis. By doing so, I hope we have a new trend, new applications, new technologies, and then uh, we have a new development, uh, the new technologies, and we can go far beyond uh, the lunar orbit or Mars or somewhere. Yes. So that's our idea. So we have about 22 academic staffs, uh, including uh, seven postdoc and three administrative staffs. So what we do is uh, research and development on seed technologies for new space applications, such as uh, image processing, so sensor technologies, and uh, uh, also the communication networks. Uh, it's a uh, terrestrial technologies, but we see uh, the potential of applying to the space. We provide in-orbit demonstration platforms, i.e. the one U CubeSat and the six U CubeSat. So we can provide platforms from one U to six U CubeSat to those who want to use space, but do not want to build a satellite. And uh, R&D on how to build satellites faster and cheaper. I think this is the central point of today's talk. And capacity building of space emerging country, uh, we are engaged in uh, capacity building activity of uh, various countries. So far, we have uh, helped uh, building the first uh, satellite of countries for more than 10 countries. Yes. And uh, also, we did advanced non satellite technologies and in orbit demonstrations. So, we are aiming for uh, doing the uh, uh, lunar exploration, for example. Okay. So, uh, so that's about it. And so lean satellites. So let me explain about lean satellites, what it is. So satellite, ordinary people think, is a bit different. Well, today's audience are interested in the CubeSat. So satellite, you think, may be CubeSat. But the satellite, your, your family or your friends, uh, or uh, the, uh, your children or whatever, they think maybe this kind of a very big satellite. So, for example, this uh, AROS satellite, Advanced Land Observation Satellite, this is very capable. It can take image of us day and night by radars with resolution of 10 meters. This was launched around 2006, and it works flawlessly for five years in orbit. Today is the uh, 10th uh, anniversary of the uh, big earthquake in Japan. Um, so there are huge tsunamis uh, embedded uh, northeast of Japan. This satellite was a central force of uh, assessing uh, damage by the tsunami. And uh, that was really the last time of this uh, satellite. Just after several months of the earthquake, 
uh, differently that, but it contributed a lot uh, to the uh, the damage proof uh, assessing. But it was very expensive, more than 500 million years ago, and it took a long time to develop. It took uh, 12 years to launch. And because uh, this satellite made by JAXA, they couldn't take the risk. So only a limited number of countries can make this class of satellites. Uh, right now, more than 70 countries uh, own, uh, launched uh, satellites, uh, including those countries from Africa and many other uh, continents. But uh, only a handful number of countries can build uh, this class of satellites because it's so complex and so, uh, so expensive and it takes so long. So why it is expensive and takes long time? Because satellite is too important. Well, in terms of the uh, society, uh, economy, society, also uh, national security from many, many uh, reasons. So fair is not options. This is a very famous wording from the Apollo programs. Oh. So risks are not tolerated. So they, uh, people use better parts, more reliable, and they need more test. Then, cost increases. It takes a long time. Then it becomes more difficult to accept failures. Then failure is not even, even, not even failure is not options. Okay. So we go through this, uh, this kind of negative spiral. So the satellite becomes uh, more expensive, uh, takes longer times. That's what happens to the longer, uh, the uh, traditional of space sectors. However, we have an alternative. So it is, uh, we call the lean satellite. So we build a satellite in a very non-traditional way. It's a different way uh, the, the people use, the different way from the method uh, which used in JAXA or many other space agencies or big company. We tolerate risk, we build satellite by very small teams. And we target low cost and fast deliveries. To do so, we take a lean approach to satellite development and management. That's what we call lean satellite. And by taking a risk, uh, the satellite has become small. Because uh, if we take a risk, uh, for, uh, for a very big satellite, I think uh, it, it's not tolerated really. It's uh, too expensive. So uh, the stakeholders say, no, no, we don't take a risk. But uh, for small satellite, yes, uh, we can. So in the lean satellite approach, well, we start from the satellite is too important, the same. However, failure of one satellite is still acceptable because we can build next one quickly. So we tolerate the risk, we use cheaper parts, and uh, we do less tests. Then the cost decreases, and time gets shorter. It may fail, yes, first satellite may fail, but we can launch another one quickly. Then, uh, the, by going through uh, this cycle, the, by shortening the uh, system life cycle of one satellite, as a, if we look at the satellite as a program, eventually <clears throat> uh, reliability of overall systems improves by having experience of buildings and also operating. So that's the approach. So how we, the, why we call this lean satellite? Uh, the origin of the name, is coming from this uh, IAA study, International Academy of Astronautics uh, Studies. Uh, I co-chaired this group, 4.18, definition and the requirement of small satellite seeking low cost and fast delivery. And uh, this uh, study group worked in, uh, in parallel with the uh, international effort of ISO standardization of small satellite testing. This, uh, Standard is already available, ISO 1963. Anyway, when we worked on ISO, 
we are up, we are asked by the ISO committees for making small satellite standard is fine. However, why don't you uh, first define what a small satellite is? Because uh, if I ask every of you, the what's the definition of small satellite? The first the answer is very diverse. Some may say small is maybe uh, less than 100 kilograms, or small is less than 50, or small is less than 150, or small is what? And also micro, nano, pico satellite. So the definitions are all different. So uh, we discussed by experts, and uh, quickly we reached a conclusion, agreement that the mass or size is not really suitable to define the satellite we are talking. And uh, so perhaps small satellite or something related to the, to the uh, size is not really good. So we should define by philosophy of uh, designing, manufacturing, and the missions and the program management. This is what uh, define uh, the satellite we're making. So we had a brainstorming sessions uh, in uh, some workshop. Uh, we had one workshop in uh, November 2014, and about uh, more, than, more than 30 people attend, uh, attended in this brainstorming. So many ideas came low cost satellite, experimental satellite, agile satellite, small scale satellite, or compact satellite, or many names. So we finally agreed on this one. So that's what, how this name came. So uh, basically, uh, there are no clear definitions, but uh, the, in this uh, study groups, we published a report finally. In this report, uh, I wrote this, uh, Kind of uh, definitions. A satellite that utilizes non traditional risk taking development and management approach with aim to provide value of some kind to the customer at low cost and without taking much time to realize satellite mission. So, in the satellite size, we have very diverse uh, range from Pico to large. And uh, for the management, uh, the styles or the development styles, we have a very traditional system development cycle processes, uh, which are the use, which are used uh, in a very expensive military satellite or human space flight, or a very expensive uh, geostationary satellite or those. To the untraditional system development cycles process for low cost and fast deliveries. So if we take risk, we cannot apply here, as I said before, because uh, stakeholders does not allow. But at this place, yes, we can still do that. So uh, it's not really the size defined. Size is really the result. Because if we try to uh, make satellite at low cost, and uh, with a short time, the satellite gets smaller as a result. So we are not building satellite from the beginning. Yes, we make to less than 10, uh, 10 centimeter. No, <laughs> we are making we, we are making satellite because uh, we we have a this budget and we have this time schedule. Then uh, satellite size uh, is uh, determined. So what is green? Uh, well. In English, uh, lean, uh, if you look at the dictionary, uh, sometimes you see the lean or what, but it's not. The lean comes from uh, Toyota, Toyota uh, the automobile. Uh, the Mr. Taichi Ono, uh, he's a uh, person who developed uh, the Toyota, so-called Toyota production system. It's Toyota production systems. This is widely adopted in the automobile industry right now, in the worldwide. So the origin of the word come from uh, this Toyota production system. Uh, and he invented many uh, things uh, which is used widely, not only automobile, but in many manufacturing sectors, uh, such as just-in-times or compounds or Kaiser. And it, but he never said ring. The name of uh, word of ring came from this book. Uh, this, uh, this book, you can still buy this one. Uh, this is the world bestseller. 
And uh, this was uh, published by MIT research teams. And uh, they investigated in the uh, late 1980s uh, why Toyota and also Honda, uh, Japanese automobile uh, manufacturer, was successful in spite of the downfalls of the big three US automakers. End of 1980s, Japanese cars uh, dominated US auto, auto market. And it was a really the highest time of Japanese economies. And so uh, these teams asked why, uh, why this is happening. And there must be some secret. So they came to Japan and stayed for some time, and they found that this manufacturing process at the Toyota. And they named this as a lean, man lean manufacturing. And, uh, if I look at, if you look at the Toyota's home web pages, official web pages, they say Toyota production system is really this one. Deliver value to the customer at the minimum cost in the shortest possible schedules by minimizing waste. Uh, this really fits to the uh, way we are developing QSA right now. Yes. So uh, in the study group, we finally uh, made this uh, final report and uh, this ones you can download uh, freely, yes, uh, from this website. I'll show you this website later, yes. And uh, in this report, we made uh, the uh, questions of the, I think uh, there were 16 questions, to scale the satellite of, of your satellite project. So you can try. Uh, this one, it takes only 10 minutes. Yes. And uh, we put the emphasis, uh, we gave some weight so that in a scale of 100, you can judge how lean your satellite is. And the category is a total cost, delivery times to uh, waste minimization. And uh, for example, the lower the total cost, I gave, it gave, gives a maximum 20% scales. And faster delivery times, it gives maximum 20%, uh, 20%. So uh, if you look at uh, these scales uh, from uh, less than one year to, to longer than three to five years, uh, you, you can have uh, some scores, depending on how long it takes. And simplicity, less number of payrolls, less number of people to develop satellites, and no hazardous explosive alternative, this affects a lot uh, for the safety, uh, safety reviews uh, when you develop satellites. And risk takings are less uh, rigorous uh, path selections, use of non space core codes, path materials, or use of non flight proven non space core items, and allowance of single point of errors. Risk mitigations and uh, reliability requirement. And uh, <clears throat> one is the failure of a single satellite does not jeopardize the problems. And uh, allowance of temporary mission downtimes. For example, if you are uh, working on a military satellite, you cannot say to the general that, uh, sorry, our satellite was down, so we couldn't detect a missile. So you cannot say that. <laughs> but uh, for, for lean satellite, you can say that, uh, yes, satellite may be down for some time, but it can recover. That kind of thing. And shorter mission time, and uh, access to, sp to space, and the waste minimization. That, those kind of things. And so uh, if you are interested, you can try uh, this one. So uh, when we think about the uh, lean satellite, we have to think this process from inspiration of the idea of use of space to materializations, actually the value delivered to stakeholders or end users or customers. For science missions, first you discuss what do you want to measure, or you have some ideas, some idea of uh, some uh, hypothesis. It may be, this particle may be affecting some, uh, some ionosphere or something like that. Then, you think you want to measure. That's a different. 
And uh, actually, you build a satellite and uh, uh, measure and analyze and uh, publish a paper. So from here to here. And uh, we have to go for a long year, two to five years or even longer. Or, and also, you have to develop a system and uh, launch, deploy, and uh, operate. So it takes two to five years or even longer. And cost is from $1 million to uh, even $10 billion. So uh, we ask questions. How do we deliver the value of satellite applications? Such a communication service, information, or science, or education, to the customers and end users at low cost and in short time while competing with the other solutions. So, because you have to understand, we have a competition with other solutions. Currently, it may not, we may not have a competitor from the terrestrial, but uh, as the technology evolves, we may have a competitors. Uh, one good example is the communications, mobile communications. In the 1990s, uh, Iridiums and Global Stars and uh, those are, those are, they were constellation, communication constellations, said that they can provide worldwide mobile communications. They thought uh, the fiber optics, terrestrial mobile uh, infrastructure is still very uh, uh, weak. But uh, while it, they are it takes in time, the terrestrial optical fiber spread worldwide. <laughs> then eventually when they delivered, uh, the, they deployed the entire systems, uh, it's already uh, too late. So terrestrial applications really uh, won the competition. So such a kind of thing. So there are some competition. So we have to deliver and uh, the, the value to the end users at low cost and short term. So deliver, to deliver the value at low cost, the value is really uh, something which satellite generates, not that to satellite itself. The satellite data and information extracted from the phone. So to deliver the value at low cost, uh, first, uh, there are many issues. The launch, you have to think about satellite mass. After all, yes, the light as a mass uh, is cheaper. And uh, when you are thinking of constellations, uh, vertical integrations or partnership with launch providers is really a uh, One very good example is SpaceX. Yes, they own a uh, rocket company. They own the rocket also they build the satellite by themselves. So, they, so that's why they are uh, deploying uh, their constellation so rapidly, also at so low cost. And infrastructures, ground stations, and testing facilities, if you are building only uh, one CubeSat, you don't want to invest in an infrastructure of a testing facility. Or even a ground station, you may rethink. And satellite hardware, and the personnel uh, for university uh, satellite project doesn't matter. But for uh, commercial, yes, it's really the short and delivery times, it's really affect this personnel cost. And operation and maintenance. Maintenance means satellite maintenance. Uh, Lean satellite does not last long in orbit because we are using uh, COTS parts. So because of radiation. So, then uh, also uh, your technology becomes obsolete uh, in, a, in a very short time. So uh, it's better to think of replacing satellites. And this satellite re replacement cycle really affects the overall cost and uh, how to manufacture the satellite and how to operate. These, these kind of things affect. To deliver the value in short time, yes, the launch, Launch, uh, especially when you talk, think of constellations, number of, uh, number of orbital planes over number of satellites uh, units uh, and affects number of launches. So the more launches, it takes more time. For a case of uh, one single satellite probe, I think so. uh, that's not, but uh, if you think of constellation, yes, it really matters. And compatibilities, the 
you may want to choose 6U or smaller CubeSat if possible, because then uh, you have a launch, compa launch compatibility. If you have a non-CubeSat, uh, I think a launch compatibility becomes realization. And satellite development manufacturing, a cut part selections, fast interaction with part component suppliers, and interface. I'll talk about, the, about this interface later. Simple systems, simple teams, team experience. And uh, one important aspect is the compliance with regulations. So early action on our regulatory issues, such as frequency, safety, and licensing. Uh, this, may, this can really become a showstopper uh, at the last stage. Because of the, uh, the frequency license, satellite deployment launch may be stopped. So uh, this compliance is really the issue. So lean satellite studies uh, is very interesting because the systems engineering, uh, space systems is really uh, the mother of systems engineering because the systems engineering uh, really uh, became complete uh, thanks to the, this Apollo program, it's been said. It's evolved out of the space sectors to de deliver flawless systems to stakeholders, no matter how complex the system becomes. So very one good example is this Apollo. However, lean satellite is a one good example is this Toyota car. The deliver quality products at minimum cost to new stakeholders whose priority is not necessarily 100% dependabilities. So uh, this lean satellite study can really lead to a new chapter of system engineering. So as an academic, I think it's a, also it has a, some uh, meaning. So if you are interested in the lean satellite, we have this official website. Uh, you can just Google uh, Lean Satellites and uh, you can see this one. Or uh, you can send an email to this one. Yes. Okay. Also, so, uh, for the rest of my presentations, I'd like to talk about this uh, CubeSat interface, uh, which may be relevant to your the project. Also, a very uh, important aspect of our Lean Satellites. So uh, there are lots of issues for the lean satellite to evolve further. Launch, frequencies, space debris, technologies, reliabilities, philosophies, ground stations, infrastructures, and the mass productions, and delivery times or interfaces, and others. So there are lots of issues. and. Uh, so when we uh, study the lean satellite, uh, those issues may be uh, addressed. Um, however, the, I'd like to talk about these uh, three items, mass production, delivery times, and in interfaces, especially from this uh, delivery time. During the uh, uh, IAA study group, we did a survey uh, of about uh, about uh, how many? Ah, uh, yes, this twenty-eight academia and seven non-academy uh, CubeSat uh, the uh, satellite project. This includes non-CubeSat. And uh, we asked uh, the total budget, total program cost. So majority is less than three million. Oh, it's okay. Some are very expensive, well, but uh, the majority is less than three million. But uh, the delivery time, delivery time is uh, from project kickoff to the satellite delivery to the launch site. Many took more than two years. But the criteria of short may be different among the uh, different people. To me, uh, it's a two years. Yes. Uh, the, some people may say one year, some people may say six years. But for me, uh, by looking at this one, no, we, uh, we are not developing uh, satellite uh, in short time. So in another survey, 
uh, which we did uh, in a workshop, which we had uh, two years ago. I asked a uh, uh, participant how to improve, to accelerate the CubeSat delivery time. Uh, this one is just for CubeSat. And many people, uh, so I asked the questions to the CubeSat developers, also vendors. Many said interface. Uh, also, this improving software and career software interface. So, including software interfaces, so majority is really the interface. So, nowadays, we can build CubeSat by buying all the components in a, in, on the internet. I think some of you, uh, the audience, uh, are you doing this one? Because now, uh, international trading of CubeSat components is very uh, popular. However, combining components from vendors is really risky. Uh, this one plus this one plus this one, it's not equal to this one. <laughs> Uh, this is very nice, but the uh, uh, reality, if you combine these, you have a lot of harnesses. So this problem is already recognized. So if you have ever done this one, uh, you, know, you understand that uh, it, it's not easy. So many CubeSat developers nowadays tend to buy components from a just single vendor. And uh, also uh, many encounters, not only physical interfaces, but also software interfaces. So we asked uh, the did you uh, the, we asked the, uh, in uh, in this workshop whether they buy from single vendor or mixed vendors. They about one third said yes, we bought from single vendors and uh, for comps and uh, edges such things. And uh, the reason of choosing single vendors is really to avoid interface problems. Yes. So uh, people really have to avoid uh, the, this interface issues. And uh, because of this one, uh, we are seeing these CubeSat platforms in the market right now. The more CubeSat developer prefer single vendor solutions and also this is a new trend. Some are not interested in making satellites. Some, they are interested in using space, but uh, they don't want to build a satellite. They just want to their, demonstrate their ideas or payload only. And so now many vendors are moving to offer CubeSat platforms. So we found 27 companies worldwide. So there are even a hosted payload service based on CubeSat platforms. So we found six companies. So more than 30, more than 30 companies are now offering this uh, solution. Also, the issue of mass productions. This is a uh, uh, picture I took during the uh, Buzz One uh, satellite building, which we did at the QTEC. We built five identical satellites, and uh, at each table, uh, students are making uh, different uh, satellites, their own satellites. So, uh, Satellite assembly integration testing can be done in parallel by doing harness rest and batch productions and batch testing. So if we design from the beginning and harness rest is also very important issue. So we also ask how many harness they have inside the satellite. And uh, still many uh, developers are suffering uh, lots of harnesses. And one big biggest reason is solar panels and also payload bus interfaces. This requires harness, but by uh, carefully designing, you can avoid harnesses. So harness is a really matters for reliability and also for the uh, assembly times and integration. So, we are now developing CubeSat interface standards. Why? Uh, because component and platform trade worldwide. And uh, standard already could this CubeSat. And that's why people are already uh, following the, the external shape. 
But uh, there are no standards on interface between component, also between platforms and machine payload. So in the factory design files, uh, we require lots of uh, very detailed information about product interface, but often we don't have. In the factory assembly phase, uh, we have to match the physical interface, but uh, often it doesn't. And uh, in the factory integration testing phases, we have a lot of physical and data uh, interface issues. So uh, by having standard, we can avoid some of these problems. So benefit is that we can shorten the time and we can promote mass productions and assure component compatibilities. And by assuring we can have international trades of uh, components and of international collaborations. So uh, we are now running, doing this uh, interface standardization project. It is funded by Japanese government and goal is to make ISO standard uh, and by 2024. So we are doing uh, the making and the revising standard draft and the coordinating with the ISO TC20 uh, SC40. ISO is an international standard organization. Uh, this subcommittee uh, is uh, the subcommittee responsible for space hardware. And uh, we are investing, investigating uh, compatibility among CubeSat component in the market. We, uh, for the trial, we bought uh, one component from ISIS, one component from Cloudy Space, one component from GOM Space, and try to uh, combine those three, but we are having very severe difficulties, yes. And uh, we're collecting input from worldwide experts and stakeholders through IAA study group and organizing international workshops to exchange information and to discuss our standard. So uh, we are again using this uh, Lean Satellite uh, platforms. So uh, this study group uh, is used as framework to ensure participation of academia, industries, agencies. And we are meeting in various CubeSat related conferences. So uh, you can, yes, you can join. So you can send me an email or to a uh, contact address in here. Yes. So just Google the, the Satellite. So in the standard right now, we have these five items. Interface among components. Interface between platform and the mission payload. Interface we talk here is a really the bottom layer of the interface. Uh, kind of physical interfaces. And not about uh, those data uh, protocol, those things. And the document specifications to describe component interface, and document specifications to describe platform interface. It's kind of a ICD, interface control document. So and uh, also external electrical interface, umbilicals. So the document is becoming very important right now because uh, when we buy product via internet, uh, it's very important to have proper documentation such as data feed to select components to buy. If we have a common item listed for the comparisons, it's very easy uh, for the selection. Also for system integration testings, we have a very uh, detailed information, technical information, but it's not often available. So we have to ask uh, the vendors by emails, and but the email doesn't come, uh, be, is not replied in uh, maybe in a week or so, and takes a long time. And uh, yes, so this document may be the key to ensure very smooth system integration testing because uh, often this kind of the uh, interface question arises when we're integrating. So this is the contents uh, right now. Yes, uh, we have these chapters. Uh, yes, uh, in interface requirement, data sets requirement, data sets requirement for platforms and uh, external electrical interfaces. And we have uh, one uh, examples of uh, this uh, documentation. 
for the current status, uh, draft is available at the Lean Factory website. Again, if you're interested, uh, check this website. So uh, in this summer, uh, it will be pro uh, submitted. And uh, we we'll have a meeting, series of meetings to discuss draft at the Fumon Factory Conference, uh, IAC. I hope we have the face-to-face uh, -face meeting in IAC also. Uh, international workshop. Uh, this is the week of December 6th, and from Taiwan, I think perhaps you can come. Probably by this time, I think station is uh, already improved. So, all for other Lean Factory related conferences. So, the conclusion and uh, development and utilization of Lean Satellite is a uh, prolific worldwide at a very uh, rapid pace. If we look at the statistics, uh, many countries are launching fast satellite of the country by one UK satellite. More than 20, I think uh, 30 satellites, uh, more than 30 countries, yes. And uh, so uh, it is a very good entrance uh, for the emerging countries. And uh, this really the spreading worldwide. And the lean satellites have possibility of diversifying the space sectors. So not only those are new countries, but uh, many new, uh, many companies which which were not associated with space at all, they are coming, entering. I think it, it is happening in Taiwan also, it, it is also happening in Japan also. Bring, that will bring new talents, new ideas, and new money. And the uh, possibility of making revolution on the use of space because a uh, well, lean satellite cannot replace all of the uh, traditional satellites, yes. So it's really complementary. Uh, there are areas which the rain satellite or cube satellites are really uh, suitable. But there are areas where the traditional satellites are really suitable. Yes. And the possibility of uh, bringing a new concept to uh, systems engineering. So, and uh, we still have a lot of challenges, lots of improvement, but uh, this challenge make uh, them uh, evolve on the others. So if you are interested, please go to uh, this website. I think that's it for now. Uh, I'd like to take a question. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Professor Cho, for a very interesting talk. Um, uh, I'm very curious. So uh, I understand that uh, QTech was very pioneering in developing the lean satellite concept. However, uh, did the satellite program at QTech start with uh, the objective of developing lean satellites, or was that some type of natural evolution? And if so, did you encounter any difficulties from funding agencies regarding the differences between developing a lean satellite and, say, a traditional satellite? Well, uh, actually, no. The QTech satellite started as the uh, QTech satellite started as the student satellite. This whole year too. So uh, the so idea of green satellite came after the, we, 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 we started this, uh, this uh, our satellite project. And uh, yes, we cried uh, many times with, uh, with JAXA. <laughs> however, however uh, it's uh, mostly related to uh, the system safety, safety uh, review or other things. Uh, basically, uh, other things uh, we do by our own way. Uh, what are some differences in terms of project management between, say, a lean satellite and a large satellite? I understand uh, part of uh, the whole lean satellite concept involves differences in project management to ensure you can still deliver a product, but at the same time, maybe not as much overhead as a large satellite. Yeah. I think uh, the, the most important thing is the risk. Uh, sometimes uh, risk and the number of uh, teams. Yes, uh, number of teams uh, typically 10 or less. And uh, with very small number of people, we build a satellite. And uh, they have uh, the intensive communications in, a, in a very small, uh, in, in one room, and they develop. And uh, so uh, that can minimize all the waste of communications. Or also, sometimes we can uh skip the documentations very detailed documentations so uh that that's one thing another one is a 
risk taking. So uh, we try to have the reliable system as much as possible. However, at the end, uh, sometimes we have to take the risk. And uh, the, so we balance with the cost, schedules, reliabilities, and uh, if we uh, if we say it is okay, uh, well, this may not work, but, uh, but uh, let's try. Something like that. So in JAXA, they, they never allow that one. <laughs> okay, I see. Um, so are there any questions from the audience? If you have a question, please feel free to unmute yourself or uh, raise your hand. Okay, while we wait for uh, questions. Um, so uh, you mentioned that the ideal size of your teams is 10 people. Is that all students, or what is the uh, breakdown between students and maybe professional engineers? Well, that depends on uh, the what satellite you are building. Yes. Uh, <laughs> let me explain my, uh, our example. Uh, this bird three satellites, we built three satellites by seven students. All the uh, seven students only, because this is education satellite, and uh, this is already uh, we we had already experience of this uh, the previous satellite yes, and uh, also because this education uh, so student learning is really the key, and uh, this satellite is a Kitsune satellite. Uh, it's about uh, ten to fifteen, and uh, we have uh, four uh, four professionals. Uh, paid the salary. And uh, they really work on uh, very critical systems, like a mission payroll and uh, overall project management. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also uh, have the uh, graduate students working. And because uh, this uh, project uh, of the funding and also uh, this is collaboration with the external stakeholders, so then we have to make sure that the satellite works. Of course, we do not guarantee, but uh, we have to try as much as possible. OK, let's see. Um, we have a question from uh, the audience. Uh, <laughs> go ahead. Can I ask, Professor? Uh, yeah, Jose, please go ahead. OK. Um, good morning, Dr. Cho. First of all, congratulations on the successful launch of War and East at one uh, I am a Paraguayan student in Taiwan after after coming here <laughs> okay. by the Paraguayan Space Agency. Okay. I have a question regarding the terms that you contemplate within the LINSAT study. Um, can it, the, the percentages that you have assigned, for example, for the fastest delivery time, 20% and so far and so forth, um, how did you get to that number? I mean, because uh, I, an initial approach that I can think of is that maybe you have done so after after doing maybe a failure mode and effect analysis of based on your heritage and the heritage of many other universities uh, how did you do it how did you come to that number in particular or those uh, numbers in particular uh yes uh we discussed these questions during this iaa study group yes we had uh, several meetings and in those meetings, we we talked about uh, what kind of questions and uh, uh, what this weight should be. Or oh, uh, this came from uh, this came from the uh, the really the discussion among experts. I, I didn't really put this number by myself. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Okay, we have a typed question. Um, in comparison to traditional satellites, how long is the average lifespan of lean satellites before they degrade? You mean in, in orbit? Uh, I assume the yeah. I assume this means uh, in orbit. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, biggest uh, thing, biggest issue is a uh, radiation impact on uh, electronic parts, because many lean satellites uh, use uh, cut parts. Yes. Uh, ah, yes. Of the electronic parts, and which are not guaranteed for the uh, total ionization dose. For single event, yes, you can do the testing on the ground for the key item, and uh, but that for total dose ionizations, 
uh, well, you can do the test. How about the, you cannot guarantee all of the parts and everything. And uh, typical coat parts, uh, if you do screening carefully and, uh, and uh, gather the information, typically it can last about three years in a lower orbit environment. And it's about 10 kilograms. That's based on our experience also. Uh, we, have, we tested a lot of the electronics parts so far, and especially the uh, uh, MOSFET 50. And uh, they can, many can last uh, 10 years. But uh, uh, that doesn't mean it can last 100 kilolarts or something. So 10 kilolarts is a kind of good number. And that corresponds to about three years. So personally, I do not trust if somebody says my CubeSat is designed to last uh, 10 years in orbit. And uh, so I, I have a strong doubt if somebody says, because uh, the electronics part is not guaranteed for that uh, length. Yes. So my answer is maybe three years. Okay. Uh, just on a related question, what sort of criteria do you use to qualify the electronics in terms of rad hardening? Do you go by any particular standard? Uh, no, uh, we take the flat heritage. The most story if things worked in space, we keep using. And uh, for key critical items, uh, professor. Professors, uh, we do the uh, single event test. And uh, also, we put some mitigations uh, for the uh, power effect and those things. Yeah. Okay, I see. Uh, I believe we have time for uh, one more question from the audience. If uh, anyone has a question, please feel free to raise your hand or unmute yourself or type something in the chat. Okay. Um, if there are no further questions, uh, thank you very much, Professor Cho, for uh, giving us a very interesting presentation, and it's certainly very inspirational for us who are just for those of us who are just getting our program started. And of course, uh, when the world returns to normal, you are very welcome to come visit us in Taiwan. Yes, I hope. Okay. <laughs> I hope. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.